let's talk about the human soul. The value of it, the practical value, is that it, it just the knowledge itself ennobles our perception of ourselves. Science tells us how the body works. It's not always so noble. <laughs> but yet, just knowing gives us a broader picture. It, it, it elevates our perception. It broadens our, our horizons. The more we know about ourselves, particularly the soul, the greater respect we have for the human condition, for uh, life itself. So just the knowledge alone, before you apply it even, is just, it, it's, it, it's like a, a balm to the mind. But we'll see if there's any, any practical application as well. So, the soul, also known as the vital force, is a living entity that animates the body. The body without the soul is a uh, hundred pounds of clay. When the body and soul come together, they merge so thoroughly that it really is hard to know where the body ends and the soul begins. And that's why the experience of the body affects the soul, and of course the soul affects the body. Illness, by this definition, is when that particular function of the soul is not connecting um, well or sufficiently with that particular part of the body. So vision, for example, is an activity of the soul. The eyes don't see. The soul sees through the eyes. But if the eyes are clouded, the soul can't see. If the soul doesn't want to see, the eyes get clouded. <laughs> so if the soul withdraws from the body, for whatever psychological reason, then the body suffers. When the body is damaged, the soul suffers, because it can't function. So it hears through the ear, it sees through the eye, it speaks through the mouth. And that's why when the soul leaves, the eye is intact, but there's no vision. The ears are intact, but it doesn't hear anything. So all symptoms of life are from the soul. The body is the vehicle. Now, the vehicle, in perfect condition, allows the soul to do what it does. So there has to be a, a harmony between the body and soul. There has to be a, an instantaneous response. When the mind wants the leg to move, it moves instantly, without hesitation, without needing to be convinced. Would you mind, please? You know, no, it moves. So the body doesn't need to be convinced, you know, like, please sit down. If the soul wants, the body immediately responds. And that's the miracle of body-soul connection, which is sometimes called the psychosomatic. The mind affecting the body, the body affecting the mind. What exactly are the functions of the soul? Because the soul is a little piece of God, it has the same characteristics as those that God used in creating the world. That's the Kabbalah part of it. There are ten faculties. Three of the faculties are mental, intellectual, intelligent, three intelligent functions, and seven emotions. That's what the soul is made of. The soul is capable of thought, speech, and action. 
That's called behavior. The soul's behavior expresses what the soul is. So, for example, speech, real speech, not babbling, means communication. The soul can communicate what it is experiencing to another soul. So what is it expressing? Itself. Its feelings and its knowledge. What I know and what I feel. Primarily, if we talk about the emotions, the primary emotions are love, hate, and compassion. Or kindness, judgment, and compassion. The hierarchy within the soul is, like everything in this universe, a perfect system where all the parts interact beautifully with each other. Like, for example, what the mind knows the heart is going to emote about. So if you tell me that uh, some guy is a really, really nice guy, I kind of feel attracted. If you tell me he's a rotten individual, I feel repelled. So what attracts me and what repels me? What information the mind gives me? Otherwise, I meet somebody, I have no idea, should I like him or not like him? Should I trust him or not trust him? How do the, emo how do the emotions know which way to go? So a good example of it is there's a submarine, and the sailors in the submarine have no idea what's going on around them. But they have this little periscope, you know, pokes up above the water, and it tells them. So if the guy looking in the periscope says, enemy ship, everybody panics. What do they know? They don't see. If the guy in the periscope says, friendly ship, they're expecting a meal. <laughs> so their emotions are actually almost created out of the intelligence. In the intelligence, we have three functions. And you know this from every company that is effective and successful has this system. There's a function in the mind that is constantly um, collecting new information, new, new ideas. This is called chachma. When you say he's a chacham, you mean he's an original thinker. He comes up with ideas, things nobody ever heard of. Everybody has that function. Anytime you learn something you didn't know before, what ability, what part of your system can suddenly know, go from not knowing to knowing? Not when somebody tells you, when you figure it out. So you're sitting there alone in a room, you've got a problem, you don't know what the solution is, you sit there doing something, and suddenly you know the answer. What did you do? Nobody really knows. Well, I thought about it. You thought about what? You didn't know the answer. What were you thinking? You were thinking the problem. Well, how does that help you find an answer? So there is this fantastic faculty where the, the inventive part of the brain then there's another part of the brain that processes. You give him an idea and he'll turn it into a machine. He'll make it work. He'll work out all the details. He'll know exactly where it applies, how it applies, when it doesn't apply. That's called Bina. This is, this is the, uh, the guy who can, who can take an idea and turn it into something. Because the genius, the Chacham, 
he may not be able to do anything with the, with, with the brilliant insight that he just got. He has more to do with it. So Einstein's greatness was that he not only could think original thoughts, question the established thinking, but he knew what to do with it. So he was a chacham and a maven. <coughs> and every company needs both. Then there's a third function in the mind. The third function in the mind, which is also a uniquely human function, is the brain asking, so what? Comes up with a brilliant idea, thoroughly grasps the idea, masters the whole idea, and then says, so, so what? So what? What are the consequences? That's called wisdom. You can be smart, and you can be knowledgeable, and a total fool. So the third ingredient is the wisdom. Or as somebody once said, what's the difference between a smart person and a wise person? A smart person can get himself out of any predicament he's in. A wise person doesn't get into predicaments. <laughs> so there's a certain maturity of the mind that is called das. That maturity or that that need, that um, quest for consequence, so what, is the link to the emotions. When the mind says, so what, it stimulates the emotion. Because so what means pro or con. So is this good or bad? So are we going or not? So should we get closer or should we run, run away? Consequence. The consequence of the information. Now there are some people who are just a chacham. They're brilliant, they have wild imagination, they can come up with brilliant ideas. They have no idea where to go with it. Not what to do, they'll never do anything. But they don't even know where to, how to develop the idea. There are people who are very good at developing an idea, they'll never come up with an original one. You gotta give them an idea and they'll, and they'll run with it. Then there's the person who excels at das, the wisdom part. He'll, he'll sit there and listen to people talk about brilliant ideas and all of a sudden he'll ask that question. <laughs> like, so what? They tell a story about a conference of scientists. One guy got up and said, I have this theory that at some time during the night, the entire universe doubles in size. Everybody got involved in this. He had mathematical equations to prove his theory, and they, and they really got into it for hours and hours and hours. And afterwards, some guys were sitting there bored, and he said, uh, so what? <laughs> if everything doubles in size, nothing's changed. <laughs> everything is still proportional. So what? And that's the guy who keeps you grounded. The wise person. I actually had this experience. I was I was teenager and I would sneak into 770 where the older boys were studying. And at, in those days we had a little respect for the older students. Respect? You heard of it, yeah? <laughs> it it existed back then. So I would sneak into, into this yeshiva and just try to listen to what the big boys were talking about. This was a Friday night, I think. And they were sitting at the table, three guys, and they were discussing the tablecloth. What determines the value of a tablecloth? These are guys who are never going to go into business. <laughs> but, you know, the brain works. So one guy says, supply and demand determines the value of the tablecloth. 
The other guy said, no, it's the gold standard and how much gold there is in the world and whatever. They, they were both pretty articulate about it. The third guy sat there and said, Chavit, listen to me. When you need a tablecloth, it's worth everything. When you don't need a tablecloth, it isn't worth anything. That's, that's the third function of the mind. The, the wisdom, the das. And that leads to emotions. And that's why the, 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 the Talmud says, more das, more pain. The person who, who is wise feels more deeply than a person who is smart. So the entire emotional life of a human being is pretty much determined by that third function of the mind. Now in the emotions themselves, there is right and left. In other words, they're extremes. And that's why physiologically, in the brain or in the, in the head, you don't have right and left. There's just a head in the center. In the brain, you have the right hemisphere, the left hemisphere. And, and by the way, there are different places in the brain for these three functions. But in the emotions, you have an extreme. Love, hate. Kindness, judgment. And that's why in the body, from the head that leads to the emotions, the body grows into extremes. Right, left. So the right side is the kindness, and the left side is the judgment. So that's why the Talmud says that a teacher should embrace his student with his right hand and discipline him with his left hand. You know, push-pull. Don't get too close. You're not his friend. Don't be cold and, dip and distant because you want to influence him. So you have to embrace him with your right hand, but keep them at a distance with your left hand. That's just a good way to raise children. Now, although they are opposites in their function, in an intelligent human being, they have to work together. You can't have extremes. I mean, you do have it, and then you've got to take them away. <laughs> Those people are not functional. So there has to be like a, a harmony between the extremes. Uh, that's called humility. When the extreme love and the extreme hate can humble themselves and allow for the other possibility, that is a very balanced human being. But if the kindness has no tolerance for the judgment, and the judgment will not allow for kindness, you have an extremist, dangerous person. Either way, if it's extreme kindness, he's dangerous, and if it's extreme judgment, he's dangerous. Because every extreme is destructive. So there's a certain humility within the system, a softness that allows compromise, interaction. The difference between the mind and the heart, which tells us a lot about ourselves, the mind, all three functions, the Chachma, the Bina, and the Das, are objective. By nature, they're objective. They, they want to know what's what. The emotions suddenly turn subjective. I love, I don't love. Now you've moved me either towards or away from the subject or from the person or whatever it is. So the emotions, all of them, are me, me reacting. So the mind, being objective, has this fantastic ability to question itself. Two and two is four. That makes a lot of sense. But let's make sure. If I have four, 
and I subtract 2, it should end up being 2. It does? Okay, I've proved my theory. Why did I need to prove it? The mind at questions itself. The mind wants to confirm its own theory because it's objective. I have an idea, but I don't know, good idea, bad idea, right, wrong. So it checks itself. The emotions don't do that. So when a person says to you, two and two is four, and you say, are you sure? The guy will say, well, I'll, I'll check. Let me check. A person tells you he's angry, and you say, really, you need to be angry? He doesn't check. He gets angrier. <laughs> You're questioning my anger? Emotions have no tolerance for objective. So spare me the facts. Those are the emotions, not the mind. So emotions necessarily are subjective. This is me. So if I like what I see in you, and I say, I like you, I love you, it better be subjective. Otherwise, we don't have a relationship. I don't want your approval. Don't tell me I'm right. I'm not in school. If you have a relationship, it has to be subjective. You make me feel good. Or you make me feel scared. So the emotions need to be subjective. The trick is, if you want to be a real mensch, whatever that means, <laughs> you know, growing up, I would hear that word a lot. It's like, clear up the table for you when you finish eating. Be a mensch. I said, oh, being a mensch is like being a waiter. <laughs> but then, help your brother. Be a mensch. Said, oh, so that's, <laughs> took many years to figure out what is a mensch. You know? So to be a real mensch, you, you want to bring some of the objectivity of the mind to the emotions. A real mensch gets angry, but then asks himself, what, what, what am I angry about? That's really a function of the brain that does not naturally happen in the heart, where the emotions are. And that's why a child whose mind is not yet fully developed is an extremist. Every child's an extremist. All or nothing, black and white, I'm angry, that's it, world's over. If I can't have it my way, I'm holding my breath till I die. There's no... So, as we get older, hopefully, the objective ability of the mind enters into the heart, and even your emotions become a little uh, removable. You can remove yourself from your emotions. It's not fatal. I'm angry, and that's it. I'll get over it. Maybe I shouldn't be angry. Next time I won't get angry. <coughs> I, can, I can create some distance between myself and my emotions, even though they're my emotions. This is me feeling. So I don't want to become completely objective in my emotions, because then I'm just a walking brain. As a comedian says, you know, intellectuals don't know they have a body. They don't know they have a body. To them, their body is just a uh, transportation vehicle to get their mind to the next conference. <laughs> So if you're just a brain, that's not a mensch. Now, on top of the mind and heart, which is your center, there are two other faculties. Will and pleasure. These are not considered your center because in some way they're bigger than you. Your will and your pleasure 
are in some way bigger than your everyday life, than your center of personality. So if you want to know what kind of a person someone is, you don't ask, what, what do they want? Will is represented, actually, by uh, in Jewish tradition, the kippah. This is will. Will is higher than the mind. So in the totem pole, this is the will, this is the mind, this is the heart. The, the emotions. Will is a powerhouse. When you want something, really want something, everything obeys the will. When you want something, your mind will make sense of it. When you want something, your emotions will agree. Because <coughs> nothing can resist your will. So we talk about biased thinking. If you already want something to be acceptable, your, your brain will come up with reasons to make it acceptable. It's not objective anymore. Now it is the slave to your emotions. Pleasure is even more powerful. And that's even higher than the kippa. That's the black hat. So on top of the head, when we're davening or learning or whatever, we put on the kippa and the hat. Because there's will and then there's pleasure. Pleasure is even more powerful than will. The will simply imposes its demands. Will power. It imposes its will. Pleasure permeates. Pleasure doesn't tell the mind what to think. It seduces the mind into thinking pleasurable. So it's like the oil. It soaks through everything, and everything becomes pleasure. So the function of the mind stops being intelligence. It starts experiencing the pleasure. The function of the heart is emotions. No, it stops. It feels the pleasure. And that's why if you're experiencing a real pleasure, all other functions join and become pleasure. That's called ecstasy. Ecstasy means your entire system is doing only one thing, feeling the pleasure. And that is so intense, you can literally die from ecstasy. And there have been holy people in history who got so ecstatic and the pleasure of their godly experience was so intense, they didn't survive it. And God has to command us, don't do that. Control yourself. I need you here. I don't want you dying. So, if a person is somewhat deficient in emotions. What do you do? A person doesn't feel kindness, doesn't have a kind bone in his body. How do you fix it? The assumption is, push kindness. Demand kindness. Criticize him for lacking kindness. Punish him until he becomes kind. This is destructive behavior. If you want to develop kindness or increase kindness, go to its source. What is the source of kindness? It's an emotion. The source of emotions, intelligence. So if you want more kindness, convince yourself logically convincingly that kindness is necessary, that kindness is beautiful, that kindness is right. And if your mind really 
explains it well to yourself, you will find yourself becoming kinder. That's basically what education is all about. Raising children. How do you raise children? You fix things in their source. You don't force. There's another method that was always popular. It also doesn't work that well. And that is called uh, inspire, excite. Get really excited about kindness. Show a real intense um, inspiration to kindness. Get people together and talk about kindness and, and, and get really emotional about it and it's so beautiful and it's so... You get a powerful reaction, but it lasts about a week. Inspiration is a fake or shallow form of motivation. Real motivation has to come from conviction. Are you thoroughly convinced that this is the way to go? The fact that it's beautiful, it's nice, it's exciting, look, it's fun, it's blah, yeah, that's good for an hour. It's not real. Many religious movements use um, stimulation to inspire people. It's not healthy. And it doesn't last. It's just a, a point of practical application. When the Rebbe was ill, all the experts expressed concern. Without the Rebbe, Chabad is going to fall apart. Without the Rebbe, it's all over. And you know the fact that after the Rebbe passed away, the, the movement increased, it tripled. And now everybody's trying to figure out how come. And this is basically the answer. If we look at how the Rebbe raised us and how the Rebbe motivated us, there was no excitement, there was no hype, there was never like, wow, isn't this great? No. It was, do you understand? You understand? How come you haven't asked me any questions? How am I supposed to know if you understand if you don't ask questions? <laughs> so it was a thorough um, educational process to where the average chassid, not particularly gifted, thoroughly understands the value of what the Rebbe was saying. So without the Rebbe, what is he going to do? He's going to live by that value. What else has he got? So instead of falling apart, it actually increased. So if you see, uh, what are they called? The, uh, those religious movements that are very, yeah, they are cult, but they use this, this you know, hyper excitement of... Revivals? The holy rollers and the... And everybody comes out so excited and so inspired and... and <laughs> it doesn't last. So, if the emotions are lacking, where do you go? You go to the mind. The reason you're behaving this way is because you're not convinced that you should behave differently. I once asked one of my really impressive teachers, I said, how come it's so hard for people to stop smoking? That was a big crisis back then. Everybody smoked. And they were trying to stop. So what's the difficulty? He said, the difficulty is convincing yourself that one cigarette is terrible. See, everybody agreed, chain smoking, got to stop, it's killing you. Nobody was convinced that one cigarette is terrible. So what happens? 
have one cigarette. Yeah, but that was 20 minutes ago. So now I'm going to have one cigarette. And it's so hard. So the difficulty is not because we're weak or because we're so indulgent or because we're so addicted. It was because I'm not convinced. Oh, sure, I don't want to be a chain smoker. But I'm not convinced that this cigarette is wrong. So I'm going to smoke. And you can't do that with food. <laughs> you can't convince yourself that everything you eat is bad. So that's even harder to... Yeah. Drinking. Same thing. Getting drunk? That's disgusting. I have no intentions of getting drunk. I'm taking a drink. If I have to stop, I got to convince myself that this drink is bad. It's not. I'm not convinced. So there's, there's, there's the problem. When a person is really convinced of something, he is more compelled to do it than if you hold a gun to his head. An intelligent human being and human beings are intelligent by nature. If I'm really convinced of something, it is stronger, more powerful than, than, uh, than a threat of... There's a brief list, an amazing story. There was this Jewish professor, scientist, in Russia, in the bad old days. He desperately wanted to get out. Desperately wanted to get out of Russia. He found out that there's a train that goes from, uh, I don't know, from Moscow to uh, Missouri. It has a refrigerated car. Once they close that car, they don't open it again until it gets to Missouri. So the only chance is in that car. But it's a sealed car. So he studied exactly how much oxygen a human being needs for how long he can last with the oxygen that's in the car before they seal it. He calculated that he could just about make it. If there are no unexpected stops, he snuck into the car. They locked it, and they took off. It arrived, I don't know, two days later, whatever, in, uh, in Zurich, they opened the car and they found him dead, asphyxiated. The really strange thing is, the car was not sealed. The car was not sealed. There was oxygen. But because in his brain, he was calculating every hour, he actually kept a little, uh, he scratched marks on the, on the side of the car marking off the hours with some, like after a few hours, he said, getting lightheaded. He went through all the symptoms and it wasn't even happening. It was all in his brain. His mind killed him because he was so convinced. So the conviction of a mind is a very powerful thing. What happens if your mind is not working? It doesn't understand, it doesn't really grasp the idea. You're supposed to know this subject, but you don't. What do you do? If your mind is misbehaving, who do you snitch to? Who do you report it to? You report it to the will. Will can get the mind to do what it's supposed to do. You've heard of the Vilna Gaon, the famous sage from Vilna. Right? He was known as the Vilna genius. Right? So our teachers would always tell us in Yiddish, Vilna, Vilna means just want. Will, Vil, no. Vilna, and you'll become a genius. Right? 
If you really want, it stimulates your mind. It gets your mind to do what it's supposed to do. So who has authority over the mind? The will. What if you don't want? So some people say, well, convince yourself with logical arguments to want. That's going uphill. You want your mind to convince your will? It can, but it's not that powerful. It's a, it's a manufactured will. The powerful will is, is instinctive, not manufactured. Like, for example, um, a child is stuck under a truck, and you walk over and pick up the truck. I mean, it's, it's happened. Come back the next day, try picking up the truck. What is that? Are you capable or are you not? Well, he's so desperately... Yeah. When your will really wants, your mind, your heart, your emotions, your body can do whatever the will wants. Or another example which Hasidus uses. A guy was in a house and the place was burning. The only way out was a narrow crack in the, uh, in the wall. So he squeezed through and he got out. He came back later. There was no way his skull could fit through that crack. So he contracted his skull to fit through. That's how powerful the will is. But not when you manufacture it. Not if it's a will based on some concept. But what if you don't want? Where do you go? You go to the pleasure. Pleasure will motivate your will. It does. So the will to live comes from the pleasure that life has. A person who feels that there is no pleasure left for him in life doesn't want to live. So we see that the pleasure motivates the, the, the will, the will motivates the mind, the mind motivates the emotions. Now when you have an emotion, it needs expression. And it finds expression either in thought, in speech, or in action. Thought is not the same as knowledge. Thinking and intelligence are two separate things. You have to be intelligent to have what to think about. So you can't think if you don't know anything. So intelligence means what makes sense to you. Thought means reviewing in your own head what makes sense to you or what you're feeling. So you're always thinking about something, either an intelligent concept or an emotion. It's just that thought is not communication to others. Somebody asks you about a decision you need to make, and you say, let me think about it. What does that mean? Do you know or don't you know? If you know the answer, tell me. If not, what are you thinking about? Thinking means, let me discuss it with myself. Let me say it to myself, and, and I'll, I'll hear what it sounds like, and then I'll know if I want to do it or not. So thought means speaking to yourself. Speech means communicating to someone other than yourself. Talking to yourself, mm, not the right function. Right? Speech was not made for yourself. It was made for others. Who was this guy went to a psychiatrist and said, what can I do? Or as a woman, uh, a spouse asked the psychiatrist, what can I, my spouse talks all night in his sleep. He talks and talks, I can't sleep. The psychiatrist says, maybe let him say a few words while he's awake. <laughs> 
he wouldn't have to talk to himself at night. You know, give him some outlet for, if you can talk to others, that's the real function of speech. Action means to act on what you know or what you feel. The difference between them is like a bridge. <coughs> Thought is for my own purposes. To clarify something, to solidify, I gotta think about it. But it's for my benefit, mostly. Even though I'm thinking about you. So when I think about you, I think about you on my terms. That this is for me. I need to know what I think of you. So when I decide what I think of you, I don't care if it's factual. Don't argue with me. This is my thought. I think what I want, the way it appears to me. So like in marriage counseling, a guy says, you know, I had real trouble with my wife, but much better now. I understand her. <coughs> no, you don't. <laughs> when a man says, I understand her, this is trouble. You understand what you think of her. You've got her figured out, which means she now has to fit your, yeah, I know, she does this because of that, and she does that because of the other. See, it all makes sense. None of it is true. I don't care. It makes sense. I figured it out. Now I'm happy. So what if it's not true? My mind is now at ease because I figured it out. So that's like the one side of the bridge, like the, the, the base on this side of the river. Speech, you have, to, you have to step out of your reality a little bit because to communicate, you have to consider the other person. Because if you're talking in a foreign language, you're not communicating. So whatever it is you want to say, you've got to say it in the language that the listener understands. Otherwise, you're, you're abusive. You're rude. Even if you're talking in the language that the other person understands, you still have to consider how to explain it so that it's reasonable, convincing, you know, with, with an example, with a story, with an illustration. With... So you're expressing yourself. You're not completely altruistic here. You're expressing yourself, but you got to consider the other person's reality. And the main thing, if you want to communicate with another person, you have to consider the other person's interest in what you're saying. If they're not interested, you're not communicating. When do we discipline our children? When do we tell them our best ideas? When do we give them the wisest information? When they're not listening. We do it all the time. You catch a kid doing something wrong, now he's upset, he's defensive, he has to, he has to justify himself, and you're lecturing. He is not listening, he hasn't heard a word. You. How many times do I have to tell you? Infinite. Because every time you tell me, I'm not listening. So the worst time to discipline a child is when he's upset. Problem is, when he's not upset, why bother? <laughs> Everybody's happy, don't mess it up. To really communicate with your children, you have to surprise them. When they're in a good mood, you're sitting by the table, you're enjoying a meal, and suddenly you say, you know what you did yesterday and that, uh, not so cool. Wow. <laughs> He's got no place to hide. He can't hide behind his upset. He can't hide behind his shame. He can't hide behind his anger. He's not angry. He's not upset. He's not, he's totally vulnerable. He hears you. So you don't have to scream and you don't have to, you can just say, that's it. It is so effective. 
So communication means considering the other person's reality and adjusting yourself to it. So it's kind of a negotiation. I want something, but I got to say it your way. So all speech is negotiation. And that's why all politicians, all they do is talk. Because their job is to negotiate. Negotiation is the world of speech. So that's like the span of the bridge. It starts here, and then it spans towards the other, the other side of the river. Then there's action. Action also involves another person. If you do, you do for somebody. But when you do for somebody, it has to be completely their way. Not 50-50, and certainly not your way. This guy was complaining that, the woman was complaining that her husband never listens to her. He says, I never listen. Last week, she asked me to bring a flower for the table. I bought a dozen. I don't listen. She says, you see, he never listens. She asked for a flower, he bought a dozen. Good? Not good. She said, can we go away for the weekend? He booked a cruise for two weeks. Hmm? Good husband? She's miserable. He never listens. He takes her idea and comes up with a better one. It's, it's, it's cruel. When you're doing, it's all about the other person. So when she asks for a flower, he shouldn't walk away thinking, a flower? What's one flower? Get a dozen, it looks like something, you know? That is so nasty. Instead, he should think, which flower? What color? What size? What exactly is it that would please you? Because I'm doing it for you, <laughs> then I got to do it your way. And somebody asked me recently, why can't I serve God my way? <laughs> so make up your mind. <laughs> That's a, that's a contradiction. You want to serve him your way. You're annoying. <laughs> what, what can I do for you my way? No thanks. So in doing, you really have to submit completely to the other person's appetites, tastes. That completes the bridge. In order for me to connect to you, with all the pleasure that I feel, and with all the will that I have, and with all the understanding and wisdom, and with all my love, I haven't touched you yet. This is all me. My, you are my pleasure. You are my will. You are my thoughts. You are my emotions. You still don't know anything I haven't told you. I haven't communicated it. So I'm still entertaining myself using you. So, so far you are my entertainment. When do I really make contact with you? When I start to talk. But that's just 50-50. That's such a typical thing. I love you. I love you. You see, it's a, it's a negotiation. <laughs> they can say it right back to you. And he didn't really accomplish that much. By the way, don't do that. If somebody says, I love you, don't say, I love you. What are you starting a fight for? The guy's trying to be nice. <laughs> don't start a fight. You love me? Oh, I love you. Well, I said it first. Really, if somebody says, I love you, and you say, I love you, it's nasty when you think about it. 
The person is trying to convey something. I love you. See what I'm feeling? Now, now you know who I am? I love you. So who is he talking about? Himself. Your response is, I love you. In other words, enough about you, now let me tell you about me. Not nice. When a person says, I love you, you have to receive it graciously. Don't throw it back. I'm going to bounce off you. So in, in, in communication, you are making some contact with another person, but it's just the bare beginnings. In action, you have completely moved yourself from your side of the river to the other side of the river. So if I do for you, honestly, that will bond us more than my feelings, my opinion, my, my will, or my pleasure. It's the power of the deed, which explains, if you, I, I said not, we're not going to be religious, but the Ten Commandments are so disappointing. I mean, you look, think about the drama. God takes the Jewish people out of Egypt. Magnificent event. Splitting at a sea. All to get them to Mount Sinai, because he has something urgent to tell them. And they're excited. They, 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 they can barely breathe. God is going to tell them something. And then God comes down on the mountain. There's thunder, there's lightning. The place is shaking it. And what does God say? Be nice to your mother. Don't lie. Don't kill nobody. Don't covet your neighbor's donkey. Come on. Isn't that a letdown? Anticlimax? That's it? We're going back to Egypt. <laughs> you schlepped us out here to, to tell us that? The Ten Commandments has kept the world going. Why? Because it's action. He it doesn't say, it's not nice to steal. No, no. Don't steal. That's the power of the Ten Commandments. The rest of the Torah gets into explaining and reasoning, and, but the, the real foundation of it is, if you want a relationship, if this is you're going to be my people? If you're going to be my people, do it. Don't tell me how much you love me. Do it. Now, in the doing, every other part of you gets to express itself. It's like, right? You bring home the flower, and you say, see, I said I'd bring it, and I... So now your speech is validated by your action. I promised you I'd do it. I did. So now your speech is real. In your mind, you said, I'm going to bring her a flower. Until you do it, your thought is kind of airy, ethereal, barely real. You did it. Now all of a sudden your thought is real. Now, why did you think to do it? Because you love her. Yeah, but that love was mysterious, vague, invisible. Now that you did it, oh, okay, that's love. So now your love has taken on, has solidified into something substantial. And you just keep going up. Now, your reason for the relationship, for getting into the relationship, validated. Your desire to get into it, your will, validated. And now your pleasure has a, a base. Your pleasure has become more real. So without the final act, everything preceding it remains 
potential, iffy. So the person says, you forgot to bring the flower? You know, if you really loved me, you wouldn't have forgotten. Not really correct. He loves you. He loves you very much. Yeah, that doesn't do much for you, but he loves you. Or she really loves you. So why doesn't she talk nice? You, the love is not what produces the behavior as much as the behavior solidifies the emotion, validates the emotion. And that's the part of wisdom, going back, the wisdom function of the brain is, so what? Why is that a good question? Because until it produces some consequence, so what? Nice theory, so what? You love nice, so what? And that's why love is not the answer to all problems. In fact, it's the cause of many problems. <laughs> love is messy, unreliable, unpredictable. Don't base your life on love, you're in for trouble. The action does more for the love than the love does for the action. How many times have I heard couples complaining? Yeah, sure, he does. Yeah, well, yeah. I asked him to bring a flower, he brings a flower. But he just does it. He doesn't really care. And then on the other hand, the person complains. He says he loves me, but I have no, I have no proof to it. I mean, he doesn't do anything I ever asked. So which is it? If you really loved me, you would do me a favor. No. If you do me a favor, then your love will become real. That, basically, is our soul. When the soul leaves the body, it takes all of this with it. The soul that leaves the body retains all its feelings, all its mishigas. You know, an insane person dies, he's still insane. <laughs> but the soul retains its personality. Obviously, the evil goes, because in the world of souls, there's no, there's no ego. But the personality remains. If you're a gentle, soul, right? That's actually how you, how, you, how you describe it. He's a gentle soul. If he's a gentle soul, he will be gentle in heaven too. If he's aggressive and, and strong, he will be strong and aggressive in heaven too. That's why we say when a really aggressive person dies, say, go up there and straighten things out. <laughs> you make some demands of God, maybe he'll listen because you're, you know, you're convincing. <laughs> So the soul retains its personality, it retains its loves and its, and its hates, it retains its relationships, its connections, its concerns, its pleasures. And that's why it needs to go through an adjustment. Because some of the emotions and some of the pleasures uh, are irrelevant in heaven. So you've got to let them go. That's what we call hell. Hell is not a punishment. Punishment means somebody does something to you that is painful. <laughs> I think, no? What punishment means? Hell is not a punishment. Hell is the difficulty a soul has readjusting from being in a body to being without a body. So the more attached the soul was to the body, the harder the adjustment. So if you were too physical, if you were too material, if you were too hung up on your body's needs, you really don't know how to be a soul without the body until you readjust. 
So that's, that's, that's hell. Holy people, meaning people who never quite got enamored with their body, and even while they were alive, were living with their head in the clouds, for them the adjustment is easy. So we say they don't go to hell. But you don't go there. It's not a place. It's the experience. So that's why we say Kaddish for 11 months. Because it takes a maximum of 12 months to make the adjustment. And who needs the maximum? We don't want to insult anybody. So we, but they might. <laughs> so we do 11. 11 months. Because the Kaddish helps to make that adjustment. Now, uh, raising our children, he's got love, he's got hate, he's got will, he's got passion, he's got pleasure, the whole thing. But where does he find an outlet for these things? Where does a baby express its love? Through touch and through taste. the lowest of the five senses, touch and taste. Raising a child means give them a more noble outlet for their soul's functions. Move them from loving Mickey Mouse to loving their brother. Not easy. Raising means elevate the outlets for which, uh, by which this soul expresses itself. So, for example, pleasure, the highest of all functions, finds its expression in the lowest of all senses. All, the only pleasure a child or a baby feels is touch and taste. How do we get a child to get pleasure from reading? See, that's called raising a child. You get a child to get pleasure from song, from good music, from rhythm. How do you get a child to get pleasure from a beautiful scene? Beauty, related to cleanliness. How do you get a child to get pleasure from kindness? It's not enough to be kind. You want the child's pleasure to find expression in kindness. You want a child to find pleasure in learning, using his head, her head. And you see the pleasure that a child has when they figure out and understand something, much more than when you give them ice cream. Their whole being lights up. I knew, I, am, I got it. There is pleasure in every one of those activities, but the activities go from grungy, grubby, to very noble. The highest of all pleasures is altruism. Sounds like a contradiction. If you're getting pleasure, then it's selfish. No, you're getting pleasure from the non-selfishness of it. The pleasure of giving someone pleasure. And that's what serving God is all about. Serving God means it gives me pleasure to give him pleasure. So what has this done for us? First of all, we understand that ourselves a little better. Secondly, it's such a beautiful picture of what makes a human being and how we relate to each other with these faculties, with these functions. It allows us to even relate to God because he has the same functions. And here's the final conclusion. The true nature of a human being, I'm not talking religion, promised, I'm not talking ideology, I'm not talking holiness, noble, just nature, the very basic nature of a human being. 
we've misunderstood and psychology does not help. The very nature of a human being is that we don't want to be human. Make sense? By our very nature, a human being is a creature that is not content being human. Every other creature in the universe is content to be what it is. Tree is a tree, a cow is a cow, a mosquito is a mosquito. I don't know what they think, but they got no problems. They're all content being what they were created to be. The human being has like a rebellious streak. You made me human, but what have I made myself? What have I done? So just to remain human? Waste of time. The human being is not content being human. That's why we get ourselves into trouble. We gotta be something more. We don't know what more, but we're desperate. It's our very nature not to be content with what we have. Not only with our money, not only with our possessions, we're not content with our identity. God says, you be a human. So, okay, but what am I adding? That's why we hate being told what to do. Worse than that, we hate being told who we are. Don't ever label me. Because whatever label you give me, I rebel. That's not me. Even a compliment. You say to your child, you're so smart. They don't like it. Oh, so that's what I am? They'll go out of their way to do stupid things. Just to, to, to destroy your definition of them. You're such a good boy. That's the last time he's going to be good. <laughs> Don't, it doesn't work. If you say, what you just did was so good, that's effective. You're a good boy. No, I'm not. Don't tell me what I am. So we have this natural, instinctive rejection Whatever I am, if it wasn't my doing, I, I don't like it. I don't like, I don't like what I am. Nobody likes what they... <laughs> you see a picture of yourself? Nah, nah, that's not what I look like. You hear it? You hear your voice recorded? That, that's me? No, nah, I don't sound good. You get on a scale and it says whatever, and you say, nah, <laughs> that's not me. <laughs> don't tell me what I am, because I don't like what I am. I want to become something. That's the nature of a human being, without philosophy, without religion. So when you come and say, God says you should be nice, you've killed it. Stop telling me what I am. I got to become something I'm not. I have to achieve something. And if I don't know what there is that is more than human, out of desperation, I'll become an animal. I'm not going to settle for human. I don't know what's above human, so I got to go down. So I become an Olympic star. I run like a deer. Well, not as fast. I jump like a... <laughs> not as high. I fly like an eagle. So you can't compete with animals. They're always going to be better than you at their thing. And yet we're so proud. I'm the fastest runner. Yeah, among people. So, what are we trying to do? That's why... We need to know that there's something above, because that's where I want to go. I want to become more than human. 
And that desperation makes us go into cults and, and, into, and into ridiculous spiritual nonsense and thinking that's higher. And then it turns out it's not higher. It's just greedy. So, again, without, without being religious about it, if we look at Jewish life, the way Jews have lived life, it is so sane. It is more than human, and it's doable. Religion is not doable. The beauty of Judaism is it's bigger than life, and it's doable. I think that's why we've out-survived. We've outlived <clears throat> bigger and stronger and richer nations because their ideals were not doable. Aristotle, for example, brilliant man. No one can live like, like he suggests. He couldn't. He never lived by his own, by his own beliefs and principles because they're not, they're, they're not doable. Judaism is doable because Judaism says for a human being you're doing great. It's doable.